Hi, Chaplain Greg here again with our Walking in the Word series. We have left the Torah and we are heading into history. And uh, we are going to be starting today with the book of Joshua and also hopefully looking at Judges. So let's start with Joshua. So if you remember last week, Moses is standing on Mount Nebo and he watches as Israel goes off to the promised land and their destiny, led by who? Joshua. So Moses has died, Joshua is now in charge. Israel is unified behind their leader. It's like one of the only times where Israel is really unified behind a leader. And they're eagerly following God. That's, that's an important thing. Now there's four main sections to Joshua. The first one is preparing to go to the promised land. So Joshua 1 verses 1 through 9 is, is Joshua's charge to Israel. Um, be strong and courageous. This is going to be tough. This is going to be hard. This is going to take sacrifice. But we can do it because we have the Lord our God behind us. Now this is something interesting happens. Reuben, Gad, remember those are two tribes in, uh, of Israel, and Manasseh, which is a half-tribe from one of Joseph's sons, Manasseh, they decide to possess land outside of the promised land. But they do promise to fight. We can see the beginnings of eventual rebellion with this. They don't want their share in what God has promised them. They want a share outside what God has promised them. In chapter 2, we have another couple of spies. Remember in Deuteronomy, or I'm sorry, in Numbers, we had uh, ten, 12 spies that went. 10 said don't go, 2 said go. But now we're going to send two spies to stake, uh, to stake out this city called Jericho and to stake out the lamb. They go to Jericho and they realize, yeah, this is gonna be hard, but God is a bigger God. And they end up in Jericho and they're hidden by this woman named Rahab. Rahab is a prostitute and she makes them promise. I understand, she says, I, I know that Israel's coming you're going to destroy the city, but please save me and my family. And they promise to do that. Chapter 3, they cross the Jordan River, and the Jordan River splits in two. Ooh, where have we seen that before? Red Sea imagery there. The Jordan River splits, and the Ark of the Covenant, remember, the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies, and God gave specific instructions on how to disassemble the tabernacle, pack it up, and how to carry the ark it was to be carried on poles and they carried it on poles through the split jordan river chapter four a memorial is dedicated to this site and we're pretty certain of where this site is in israel today you can go down to that part of the jordan um, a lot of baptisms happen in that area where this probably happened um, but there was a dedication made at that site. Chapter 5 is the preparation for conquest. Now, way back in Genesis, way back with Abraham, God gave a commandment to the men of Israel. And what was that commandment? The commandment was to circumcise all males after being born for eight days after on their eighth day of life removing the foreskin from them Israel quit doing that and uh, God says it's time to reinstate this why do we do such an odd practice it was a way of distinguishing Israel from the rest of the land it was a distinguished mark. It was a distinguishing, it set the people apart 
from the people of Canaan who are occupying there. In their wickedness and their rebellion and in their idolatry, the people of Canaan were about to be judged. And Joshua has all of Israel's men and boys circumcised. They also reinstated the Passover. During that time in the wilderness, they didn't celebrate Passover. But they reinstated Passover. Joshua also has a very interesting encounter with a man who is neither for or against Joshua, but as commander of Yahweh's armies. Who is this guy? Jesus. I think that's who it is. I think it's Jesus. Um, but he says, the battles that are coming are a judgment against the Canaanites and not just a conquest of Israel. Chapters 6 through 12, and this is the second section of the book of Joshua. So we're prepared to go and do battle. Chapters 6 through 12 is the conquest of Israel. Chapter 6, the city of Jericho. This is where things go well. Joshua is given a very interesting set of battle instructions. Circle the city once for every six day and for six days, once a day, with the ark before them. Each day is an opportunity for Jericho to surrender. Each day they can say, Fine, God has shown up, take the city. They don't. The seventh day, they're to march around the city seven times and bl blow the ram's horns. Whenever you read blowing of the trumpet or blowing of the ram's horn, this is an announcement that judgment is coming from Yahweh. And it was judgment on the city of Jericho. The city's destroyed. And Israel is ordered to take nothing from the city. Rahab and her family are spared. They become Israelites. In fact, Rahab becomes part of Jesus' genealogy and David's genealogy. Go figure. Um, but they're ordered to take nothing from that city. It's to be completely destroyed and left as a dedication to the power of God. The city's cursed by Joshua, saying that anybody who tries to rebuild the city, their firstborn will die. And that's actually true. Herod, later in Roman times, during the time of Jesus, um, had it rebuilt. And he hired another builder to do it. And that builder's first son died. Um, all of his sons actually died during the rebuild. Not good. But the city's destroyed. It's their first victory. The next city, Ai, Things don't go so well. Joshua is defeated pretty quickly. And he just falls on his face and says, God, what? why did this happen? And God tells him, well, there's this guy named Achan in your camp, and he took some stuff from Jericho. I told him, I told you not to take anything, but he took some stuff. Well, Achan fesses up to it, and he and his family are stoned. They go back, AI's defeated. It shows that obedience is more, God wants our obedience more than he wants our sacrifice. And it isn't just obeying the jot and tittle of the law, but it's having our hearts devoted to him. So chapters nine through 12 of Joshua, we have a whole bunch of battles. Uh, we have the full list of the battles in chapter 12, 9 through 24. And then chapters 13 through 22, we have the division of the land. So not all of the people were conquered in, uh, in Canaan, even though they were told to. Again, not doing what God told them to do. Uh, the land's divided up in Judges 18. Dan 
So we're, we're in the book of Judges, we're gonna, which we're going to get to in a second. Dan actually renounces the part of the land that they were given because it was too hard. This is the land where the Philistines were. They decide to give that up, and in Judges 18, they move to the northern part of Israel. And it became the center of pagan worship in all of Israel. And when we get to the New Testament, there's a really cool story about Jesus using that area in, in part of his ministry. But from Dan, the uppermost north, to Beersheba, the southernmost part, Israel stakes its claim. Chapters 23 through 24, Joshua gives his final speeches. And uh, I think the verse that really hits the most is in Joshua 24. And it's in verse 15. But if it doesn't please you to worship God, choose for yourselves this day which will you worship, the gods of your ancestors who worship beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites whose land you are living. As for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. This is the last thing he's telling Israel. Your choice is before you. Where have we heard this before? Serve the gods of the Canaanites or serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. And that's where Joshua ends. And that brings us into Judges. And Judges, kind of like Deuteronomy, is a very, very dark book. It's a tough book to read. It has some very horrific images. But here's the point of, of Judges. God uses some very messy, messed up people to do some amazing and sometimes some very messy things. Now there's a cycle that you will see throughout the book of Judges. First, Israel sins. Second, God allows a pagan group to torment them in some way. Third, Israel repents. Fourth, God sends a judge. Fifth, Israel is saved by that judge. Six, all is good. Seventh, we repeat the cycle because all is good. Just for a little while, Israel sins again. There are a number of judges throughout this book. Now, when I mean judge, I don't mean a guy who sits in a robe with a gavel that bangs it and declares something legal or not. No. A judge is kind of a military commander who takes charge and who speaks for God and um, is responsible for freeing Israel from its current torment. That's who they're calling judges. And the six main judges are a fellow named Othniel, another fellow named Ehud, uh, Deborah. Deborah's awesome. She's great. Uh, Gideon. Uh, Gideon is, is in chapter 6, verses 11, through chapter 8, verses 35. So Othniel, Ehud, and De Deborah, they're pretty good. They do their job. They free. They go do their thing. Gideon, the judges start kind of their decline in moral character. It's sort of like it goes up, and then at Gideon, it starts heading down. Gideon frees Israel, and you can read that, in, like I said, in chapter 6, verse 11, through chapter 8, verse 35. He begins his ministry by destroying an idol. He ends his ministry by worshiping an idol. He begins his ministry being faithful. He ends his ministry ending up a hyper-polygamist with many, many wives and being completely unfaithful. At the end, he acts like a king. He's not anointed king, but he kind of acts like a king. He worshipped idols. His son Abimelech kills all of his brothers. So Gideon has over 70 brothers, so he probably had a ton of kids. 
Abimelech kills all of them in an attempt to rule Israel. Abimelech is eventually killed in battle and Israel remains kingless. The next judge is a fellow named Jephthah. That's in chapters 11 through 12. Um, Jephthah makes a very, very foolish vow in which he says, I am going to sacrifice the first thing I see if I am successful with my military adventure. And so he goes home after being successful in his military venture, and the first thing he sees is his daughter. And he sacrifices her. Again, we are heading down. This guy is messed up. He did, he was obedient in doing God's bidding. He was foolish because he was treating God like any other Canaan God. If you're on my side, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll sacrifice. So he sacrificed his daughter. We finish up judges, or, or the list of judges with Samson, and that's in chapters 13 through 16. So Samson's an interesting guy. He's not a good guy. If you ever see a movie on Samson and it's not R-rated, they didn't do it right. I'm telling you, he, he was not a good guy. But he was promised after a visit by the angel of the Lord to his parents. His parents aren't named. And they give him a Nazarite vow. Now, read Numbers 6, uh, verses 1 through 21 on what that involves. But it was a special set-apart people dedicated to God, dedicated to worshiping God and serving God, the Nazarites were. So they set Samson apart because they were old. They weren't expecting a child. Ooh, we've heard that before, right? And they were given a child, so they gave him back to the Lord as a Nazarite. One of the Nazarite vows is you don't cut your hair. Lots of other things. You don't drink wine, you don't touch dead bodies, all of these things. Um, Samson broke every single one of those vows. He even cut his hair at the end. He led an extraordinarily corrupt and violent life. He sold out to this woman named Delilah, who was a Pharisee temple prostitute. And she was a prostitute to the god Dagon. And he allowed her to cut his hair. After he had his hair cut, he had this amazing strength beforehand where he could defeat thousands of people and um, do super, superhuman things. He loses all of his strength as soon as that last Nazarite vow is broken. Samson it has his eyes put out. He's tied up before the god Dagon. And the Philistines have this huge celebration. Samson asks for one more burst of power. He brings down the entire temple on the people. Hundreds of people are killed. And that ends his story. Like I said, Judges is a violent, disturbing book. And believe it or not, the final chapters, it gets worse. And I'm not going to go into detail because it's Read it. I encourage you to read it. Um, but it's a civil war against Benjamin in which almost all of Benjamin is wiped out. And it's over something really horrible that happened. But here's the point. The point comes at the end of Judges, chapter 21, verse 25, where it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Again, the basis of sin is doing what you think is better than God. So that's it for today. This is Chaplain Greg. Um, next week, we're going to have a much better story to tell. And you remember I talked about Moabites? This next Ruth Moab becomes important. So until then, if you like this channel, Please like and subscribe. 
uh, share the video with friends. And uh, until next week, God bless.